Okay, thanks everyone for joining us today and for joining us in person, which I know is a brave new world, particularly if you work in the area of pandemic preparedness. Um, I'm Amanda Glassman. Um, we're talking today about the other global challenge, pandemic risks and the World Bank Roadmap. And we're excited to convene this event alongside our colleagues uh, at the Pandemic Action Network. So we've been working on international financing for pandemic and preparedness and response for several years, including via support to the G20 high-level independent panel on the future of financing pandemic preparedness and response in 21-22. And this report, along with the many other reports that have been issued after the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014, the SARS outbreak, um, and, and now COVID-19 uh, finds about the same kinds of issues, right? Which is limited coverage and effectiveness of existing preparedness investments, particularly when we compare to natural disaster preparedness, which has been absolutely at the core of many government's functions. Um, and really the evident failure of the system related to the unmitigated spread of COVID-19, an airborne pathogen, 20 million deaths and counting, the huge gaps in available financing for this essential public health infrastructure, estimated at about 10 billion per year on top of needed domestic spending around the world, and the absence of pandemic preparedness and response as a shock, as an external risk to be addressed as part of the central mission of the international financial institutions, which historically have focused mainly on economic shocks and their consequences. So at the annual meetings last year, shareholders called on the bank to develop a plan to respond to global challenges like climate, but also pandemic risks. And in December, a roadmap was issued, which outlines an approach to evolving the mission, the operations, and the resources of the World Bank to better address these challenges. And this week, during the spring meetings, uh, the development committee is discussing what happens next. But to date, uh, I can say this because I'm here at a think tank. My view is that more airtime has been devoted to climate than to pandemic risks as a global challenge. Um, even if we look at the climate change development and development reports that the World Bank has issued and has lauded as sort of the principal tool with which to organize assistance, there's the notable absence of human capital, of people and health as part of the story around climate change and what to do about it. Also last year, of course, the pandemic fund was launched, uh, which has just issued its first call for proposals. I think you all know the demand for that call has, is huge, many billions. Uh, Carolyn will give us the exact figure, um, but the proposals have only, um, excuse me, the amount available so far amounts to about one and a half billion dollars. So with pandemic potential outbreaks potentially increasing in frequency and severity, I think the time is now to address pandemic risks as a central global challenge, and that's what our panel is about today. We're going to kick off uh, with the video recorded intro from Senior Minister of Singapore, Tharman Shen Mugaratnam, who is the co-chair of the G20 HLIP. He'll talk about what he sees as the necessary shifts for the World Bank and the MDBs to more effectively respond to global challenges and then we'll be up here with a fantastic panel. So over to Tharman, virtually. Thank you for inviting me to join you. Thanks very much to Center for Global Development and the Pandemic Action Network for bringing us together and giving me this opportunity to uh, address you. Uh, the theme of this uh, conference is um, uh, important and timely. Uh, it's important because the global health risks that we face are central to a whole set of other risks and central to global well-being uh, in ways that um, we didn't need COVID to remind us of, but in ways that are going to require a lot more attention and focus, uh, both in national governments as well as in the way we go about our business multilaterally. I would say the World Bank and the MDBs need to undergo five broad shifts for us to achieve our objectives. First, we have to make sure that country engagement models at the World Bank and the MDBs incentivize governments themselves to invest in pandemic PPR, but incentivize governments to do their part to have coherent medium to long-term plans 
to enhance national resources through progressive tax systems and to invest where the highest social returns are over time. And the World Bank is very well placed to do that. Our national governments are always under short-term pressures and voters don't notice when pandemics don't happen. They don't notice when you've succeeded in preventing pandemics from happening. They only notice when pandemics happen. And that's a nat natural political failure almost everywhere in the world. And the MDBs are a very important way in which we can incentivize governments uh, to avoid that failure, or at least to mitigate that failure. So let's not lose sight of that. It does require, I believe, more concessional finance for pandemic uh, prevention and preparedness because the externalities are large. The benefits are not captured by the countries themselves, particularly for low-income countries and lower-middle-income countries. So that's the first shift. Work in a concerted way to incentivize national governments to do their part. Secondly, and this is a complex matter, the shareholders of the World Bank have to enable it to use new levers so as to make regional and global initiatives that rely on member state support. The country engagement model, having country ownership at the core of the World Bank model, is basically right. But we've got to help countries to take part in regional and global initiatives that are in their interests. In other words, find that conjoining of national interest with the global public good. And I believe it can be done. Uh, the IDA, for instance, uh, through its regional window, uh, is able to provide grants to regional entities, just as an example. And we, we think of the types of programs we need globally uh, to avert a pandemic and to respond when a pandemic hits. Uh, it does require support to low-income and lower-middle-income countries and some middle-income countries um, to help them take part in those schemes and particularly to be able to invest in advance of a pandemic. A third um, important dimension of this has to do with surge financing. The MDB system is capable of larger and swifter um, disbursement of um, support in a pandemic. Um, I think we did reasonably well the last time, but we've got to do much more and much better the next time round. Uh, the bank, the World Bank, can expand use of its uh, catastrophe-triggered instruments for fast disbursing f financing, but also um, can do more to provide for operational flexibility with regard to other instruments by loosening the safeguards and the, the caps on financing during a pandemic. And we have to ensure that the World Bank and the MDBs act in concert with the IMF in this regard, so that the combined surge financing capacity of the international financial institutions uh, is significantly increased. The fourth shift that is important, and is of a broader nature, of course, is providing the World Bank and the MDBs with the right mandate and financing capacity. The shareholders have to provide this. And our aim should be to avoid a trade-off between national development priorities and investments in the global public good. In truth, in the long run, there is no trade-off, but in the short run, there can be a trade-off because countries don't see the benefits immediately of investments in global public goods. And the whole aim of using the World Bank and the MDBs and the IMF has to be to reduce that trade-off. And indeed, there is significant scope for financing programs that are at the intersection of national development and the global public good. I spoke earlier about national healthcare systems, for instance, but there are many other examples of how this can be done. Our oh, investments in surveillance systems, for instance, surveillance systems for future infectious disease outbreaks, has clear benefit nationally. Uh, we know that. Our investments in data systems, uh, data 
systems which are in fact largely lacking, not only uh, not digitized, but even lacking in analog form, uh, will pay off nationally and greatly, but also helps the global public good. And there are many other examples, but we have to use the MDBs to minimize the trade-off programs for national development benefit and the global public good. And ultimately, that must mean that shareholders provide the World Bank and the MDBs with more resources over time. It does require, at some point and on a regular basis, replenishment of equity and concessional resources. We can't escape that. It cannot just be a matter of using balance sheets more efficiently. Uh, it has to be, but cannot just be a matter of mobilizing private capital. That's central, of course. But ultimately, you do need more equity coming from member states, and you do need more concessional resources. So let's bear in mind that broad financing picture. It is in all our interests, countries rich, middle income and poor, to invest in these very efficient international financial institutions, efficient from the point of view of multiply, multiplying resources and multiplying impact. Fifthly, another very important um, shift and angle to the advantages that the World Bank brings, and the World Bank in particular, is achieving synergies between the different global public goods, which clearly interact with each other. Um, take the example of water. We do have a global water crisis. It's the most neglected dimension of the global environmental crisis, but it's critical. It is immediate, it is now, it, is, it harms economic and social well-being, and it's critical to minimizing global health care risks. We have a real problem on our hands. We know about the extreme floods and droughts uh, that have been hitting us, as well as wildfires and heat waves. But we also know about the longer standing tragedy where more than 2 billion people do not have access to safely manage water. Uh, a real tragedy. And as a result, one child dies every 80 seconds from diseases caused by unsafe water. One child every 80 seconds. Water is central to global health and it's central to the health of every community. And we have to manage water better nationally and globally, which is why there was a UN water conference two weeks ago in New York, the first in 47 years. So that's a fifth important shift, how the World Bank in particular can achieve synergies between programs that address global warming, the loss of natural capital or biodiversity, and the water crisis, together with addressing healthcare risks. They go hand in hand, and we've got to achieve synergy between these programs, capability development synergies, as well as delivery synergies. And we've got to maximize impact for every dollar spent by bringing those programs together. So let me end off by saying that I'm optimistic because these are all things which can be done. We know the broad outlines we do not need perfection before we move ahead, and it will be very dangerous to wait for perfection before we, we move ahead. We have to recognize it is in all our interests to invest at higher levels, nationally and through multilateral platforms like the World Bank. It's in all our interests. The payoff for countries rich and poor will be very large if we do so. And we have to do so in ways that rides over the current geopolitical and geoeconomic fractures and difficulties and recognizes that this is what binds us together as humanity and this is what is in each of our national interests. It pays off for each of us nationally. So let's do this. Do this with some urgency, focus and scale.
to not do so, to not invest, and to not pool our resources will be irresponsible and myopic. And I think we can avoid that. Thank you. Okay, thanks to Tharman. He has slightly longer remarks that you can see online after the event, um, but I think his main points are made here. Please. Okay, I'm joined today by a great panel, starting with uh, the honorary Dr. Wilhelmina Jala, who's the Minister of Health of Liberia. Um, Eric Meyer, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Africa and the Middle East at the U.S. Department of Treasury. Juan Pablo Uribe, who is the Global Director for Health, Nutrition, and Population and the Global Financing Facility at the World Bank, and Carolyn Reynolds, the co-founder of the Pandemic Action Network and Partner in Crime. So I think we should kick off this panel hearing from the minister. Uh, obviously, Liberia has really experienced the effects of rapidly spreading outbreaks, the panic that ensues, both the human consequences and the economic consequences. Tell us a little bit about what you would like to see from the international system and the World Bank in particular. Uh, good morning to all. As I rested last night thinking about this meeting, I wanted to start at a different point. And the point is that uh, in 1978, we signed the AMA-ATA, mm -hmm. stating to us that primary health care uh, was very important for every country. And I think countries went ahead and left other countries behind and primary health care were never, were never a priority. In uh, 2014, three countries were affected by Ebola. And during that Ebola time, we found out, we learned something, that the community was very important in any epidemic. Then we went on in 2018 to sign the Astana Declaration. Again, primary health care were on the top of the ladder. But I'm glad to be sitting around a lot of experts. And some of the things that were identified from that uh, declaration was that it lacked leadership, economic crisis, on regular private health care, epidemics, and poor investment, which was the recipe for COVID. And again, every country suffered. Whether you have good primary health care and poor community service, you, you saw the results. Those countries like ours who had uh, a little bit of uh, structured community service for poor primary health care, we suffered also. So as we look at Pandemic Fund, we look at what uh, the World Bank, the G20, have put together to help us to give, to prepare for the next crisis. I hope we keep that in the back of our mind, that some countries, all countries are at different level on the kind of progress they need to make. Mm -hmm. So for us, we need to make sure that our community structure is strong, our primary health care, where most of the diseases, most of the epidemics and pandemics that you discover come from the community is the one that identify what's happening. And then before the healthcare system receives uh, 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 that idea, we should make sure that the investment will cover all of those layers mm -hmm. uh, so that country like Liberia and the rest of the lower income countries, as well as the higher income countries, will, will make significant progress this time around in terms of preparedness for any epidemic that will hit us. Community first, primary, and then before we start looking for secondary and tertiary and all of the new innovations that we want to see happen. But if we forget the basics, we'll be in another trouble all over again. Mm -hmm. So I will stop there. Maybe that's a good time then to ask you, Juan Pablo, to reflect on those basics and the investment into health systems that the bank makes. How does it serve preparedness? 
how could it better serve preparedness? And we'll come back on the issue of response later. Go ahead. Thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy to be speaking after listening to, to Minister Wilhelmina because um, I, I think she's, she's sending the most important message here. And it's that for future pandemic preparedness and prevention, there's nothing more important than strengthening our health systems. And they need to be strengthened from the basic, from the village and the community, from primary health care. Um, I always quote Mike Ryan from WHO, an emergency expert, global expert, who always says that that last mile of primary health care is always the first mile of the response to pandemics. It's exactly the same. Um, I have a friend of mine, an epidemiologist, who says, uh, Amanda, that novel viruses have not been discovered uh, by the epidemiologists sitting somewhere away. They've been discovered by nurses and community health workers seeing their people in the village. And, and I think that's a very strong message. We, we need to invest in health system strengthening. Of course, within that and within primary health care, there are essential public health functions which are very particular, very well delimited, which will have an incredible impact in our capacity to identify a suspicious case, following a deed, delivering on the 717 proposal that we're all following, et cetera. But it's health system strengthening. From the bank, Amanda, very quickly, we, we have overall a portfolio of $35 billion in more than 240 projects in more than 100 countries, low and middle income countries. And in many of them, or in most of them, I would say that strengthening the health system through primary health care, Minister, is central. What we want moving forward, and we have explicit commitments on the IDA side, for example, around One Health and, and pandemic preparedness, is to ensure that the health system projects have pandemic preparedness components explicit built into it. Please keep in mind that 80% of the costs of pandemic preparedness and prevention are recurrent costs. Mm -hmm. They need to be paid every year, every day, again and again and again, even in the absence of a pandemic. And the only way that that recurrent cost will be covered is if we bring it into the budgets of the national health systems, hopefully with a lot of domestic effort, but with this effective collaboration that a minister is asking from us. Thank you. And I think, you know, it's true that primary health care is neglected, but I think we can also say public health and essential public health functions okay. have also been neglected. So yes. it's important to have that uh, kind of focus in the projects that you're talking about. Um, Eric, you've been um, very involved in the creation of the pandemic fund that is aiming to sort of recognize the global benefits, the regional benefits of investing in this way in preparedness. Can you reflect a little bit on what, what's happening with the pandemic fund, why it's important, but also how it fits with the multilateral development banks and with the World Bank roadmap process? Yeah, sure, thanks. Thanks, Amanda. And um, it's good to be here today to talk about this um, important topic. And I think it's also timely because um, there is, as you discussed, um, this discussion in the Development Committee carrying forward the work on the um, World Bank Evolution Roadmap. Um, and, and I think um, we very much see these as um, parallel efforts um, that are informing each other. Mm -hmm. um, to go back a little bit, um, when we were in the midst of the worst part of the COVID pandemic, um, and as we were talking beforehand, the minister reminded us that, um, that the pandemic is not just a health event. It's a social event. It's an economic event. Mm -hmm. All parts of our societies were impacted. And, and probably with COVID, I think we all around the world live that in a, in a, in a more deep way than we have in previous um, pandemics and epidemics. And one of the things that we took away very early on um, is the need to better integrate nationally, regionally, and globally, our economic, our social, and our health expertise. Um, we've been doing that um, with G20 partners um, in what we have a joint finance and health task force mm -hmm. um, that um, benefited from a lot of work under the Italian and then the Indonesian um, G20 presidencies. Um, that has a lot of work to go. Um, there is room for continual improvement. 
we spent an awful lot of time in um, the first two years of the um, Biden administration working to better integrate ourselves within the U.S. government. Um, we still have more work to do, but I have to say I'm very pleased that we, um, that we have made the progress we have, and we have a, um, a cohesive um, cross-agency um, effort that is looking at these um, types of threats and challenges, um, including new issues like you know, response financing and how do we um, think about <coughs> developing mechanisms to deal with surge financing and the like. The other piece that we identified early on was a need for a financing vehicle. Um, President Biden came out very early on this um, at the first COVID summit in September of 2021, which feels like um, decades ago at the moment. Um, you know, we called on um, other partners to join us in, in creating the pandemic fund. Um, and we used the G20 joint finance and health work to build the basis for that, to build a strong consensus, to do the analytical work that was necessary. Um, and I think really what we were trying to do was to focus on what needs to be done additional. We know the important work on primary health cares and community health that needs to be invested in. And we have a robust toolkit um, of international and bilateral partners um, working with countries on that. We didn't have the same thing focused on the specific areas of pandemic pre preparedness and prevention. Mm -hmm. And um, through the really good work of uh, Minister Tharman and others on the high-level um, international panel and um, the IPPP um, and other bodies at the time, including work in the, in the think tank community here in Washington mm -hmm. and around the world, you know, we identified some huge gaps, but with some specificity as well in terms of what was missing. The result of that and a lot of work um, amongst key partners, and I want to be clear here, this is partners that are governments, but it's also our civil society partners, our philanthropic partners, um, and the broad array of institutions that are out there. You know, we came up with the pandemic fund as an additive instrument. And I want to be really clear here, this is an additive financing instrument. It, it, the partners who came together were always clear that this was not to take away from the work that we were already doing in healthcare around the world, either through the multilateral development banks or through the um, large number of global health institutions that we have out there. And I think there is, there is a strong commitment on all of us who are supporting the work of the pandemic fund to make sure that that remains additive and focused on things, on, on key areas that haven't been addressed. This first call for proposals is, um, First of all, it's, it's amazing that it's happening. It's less than one year after the creation of the pandemic fund. Um, it's modest compared to the needs that are out there, um, but we're hoping that it is a, um, a very good learning experience mm -hmm. um, for those of us in the pandemic fund, but for our partners all over the world. And, and these partners include countries. So in establishing the pandemic fund, um, we made sure that there is a strong voice and role for what we call co-investors. They're not recipients. They're mm -hmm. co-investors because, as the minister knows well, Liberia makes investments every single day in primary health care, in surveillance, and in, as Juan Pablo was rightly pointing out, most importantly, it's the people. Um, it's the workforce, um, training the workforce, hiring them, having them ready. Um, that is probably the most important element of the front line of defense here. Um, and so I think the pandemic fund is really focusing on that in this first call for proposals. We've built a flexible instrument um, that we'll be able to adjust as we go forward um, and as we, we identify new areas where work is needed. Let me give you the parallel there for, for the work on the World Bank evolution. I think when Secretary Yellen looked at these issues, and she was an early champion of the pandemic fund, but she was also deeply engaged, as you said, on the issues around climate change. Mm -hmm and frankly, also issues around fragility and conflict. Mm -hmm. And when we looked at these, we said all of these are issues that are of regional or global significance, but impact countries as they are working to implement their own development priorities and plans. And frankly, any of these things, climate, global health, instability and fragility, can derail all of the best plans that countries have and all of the work that they are already doing with development partners like the World Bank. Mm 
And we also had gone through COVID-19 and seen the, the limits and the difficulties for the multilateral development banks in particular to respond in a timely and effective way to the needs that were, were evolving. And we looked at these things and we said, you know what? The World Bank, the other MDBs, they're an incredibly important part of our toolkit. We very strongly stand behind the twin goals of shared prosperity and poverty alleviation. And we deeply remain committed to the idea of a country-based model for development. But here in the 21st century, we've also learned that you've got to do more. And that more piece is what MDB evolution is focused on. It's how do we build and how do we put in place the systems, the processes, the incentives that are needed to begin to also help countries and regions and the global community tackle what we already know are identified threats so that the development objectives can be achieved and can, the countries are better placed to deal with those threats. Okay, well, thank you, Eric. I think we've been waiting to hear that description of how these things fit together, and I think that's a very useful uh, way to think about it. There are many, many follow-up questions I have. Um, but let's turn to you, Carolyn, on the issue first of the total financing required, you know, what we have available, the domestic resources, the MDB role, the other global health funds. You know, again, the other point is, of course, that preparedness for pandemics is not only about the health sector, but well beyond the health sector. So you, you're working with all these different stakeholders. What do you see as the big challenge ahead uh, as you contemplate the pandemic fund plus the roadmap? Thanks, Amanda. Um, maybe I'll pick up on one of the last things that, that Eric said, which is we have to do more. And I, you know, it's, it's, I'm pleased to see that this is the conversation that's happening. Thank you, Eric, for laying that out. Obviously very pleased to see that the pandemic fund has been set up and some of us have been pushing for such a dedicated mechanism for years. So these are good steps, but the ambition still, in a way, feels modest. Why do I say that when we're talking about a conversation and there's a development committee paper being discussed today about unleashing hundreds of billions of, or trillions of dollars? Uh, it says that 2.4 trillion is the figure in the uh, development committee paper about what's going to be needed to um, really uh, both address the reversals in progress on the sustainable development goals, but also address these global challenges and 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 uh, from climate to pandemics to fragility, um, big numbers, but also a fraction of <laughs> a fraction of what just this COVID crisis over the past three years has cost the global economy, um, and of course immeasurable cost in terms of lives and livelihoods. Um, we just went through a, the, the world just contributed another uh, 14, 15, I don't know what the final count was, $16 billion to a global fund replenishment last fall. Um, we'll be looking at more replenishments for uh, you know, uh, other global funds over the next couple of years. The pandemic fund itself, as you said at the outset, the, the initial, the, based on many different um, calculations, uh, including from the G20 high-level panel, was about an extra 10 billion uh, annually that we needed in, to mobilize in terms of international investment for pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. But as I think, uh, if Tharman didn't say it in this remark, he said it many times before, and President Sirleaf stressed it again last night. That's a very modest, um, uh, uh, and others said that's that was a, uh, and the U.S. itself has said a very modest and conservative estimate of what's required. Um, and comes in addition to what countries themselves need to mobilize. So we're talking about a lot of investments, but again, we're talking about pretty modest in terms of what um, what the what the counterfactual is if uh, we allow climate uh, disasters and pandemic risks and pandemics to continue to uh, evolve, uh, but also in terms of uh, in terms of setback on. Uh, poverty reduction and uh, global development goals. So, I mean, where I want to stress here is that, yes, this conversation, pandemics has been outlined in the, uh, we have a pandemic fund, we have pandemics as one of the global challenges to be solved in the World Bank, 
evolution roadmap. But to be honest, I do. It is still feels like a um, maybe asterisk isn't the right word, but it feels like still um, uh, uh, certainly not getting equal billing in terms of the systemic risks that are facing the global economy and facing humanity. Um, and we are already facing uh, seeing pandemic amnesia set in. Um, and we're not even out of this COVID crisis, right? We are seeing new variants emerge in India and Nepal that are the most transmissible yet. Um, and uh, we're continuing to see the ripple effects on um, African economies uh, uh, and other lower income co uh, country economies uh, in terms of who are uh, looking at mm. um, uh, extreme fiscal pressures, extreme debt, not just as a result of COVID, but this combination of crises, but much of it triggered by the COVID crisis. Um, and not being in a position to actually increase their health spending um, for, uh, according to the bank's own analysis, for maybe uh, four or five plus years to come. So um, the ambition is that we have to do more. And as I think uh, Tharman said, it's about um, we have to have urgency, we have to have focus, and we have to have scale. And um, so, uh, and I would like to see actually not just, I think, as you said, Eric, just see this pandemic fund and the evolution roadmap just as parallel efforts, but I'd actually like to see this conversation joined up much more together. There's reference in the development committee paper to how we have to link, uh, how, how the uh, World Bank will evolve and better leverage funds, but in fact, we just set this thing up and it has 1.6 billion out of a 10 billion annual, again, conservative figure of what we need. So it already feels like we're not, we're not tackling that. So let's, how do we join up these conversations and also make sure as we talk about more resources, but also more concessionality, that we're, we're, not, uh, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not actually growing competition, but we're actually expanding the pie. Yeah. So, okay, there's lots of things to unpack here. One, one question I want to ask you about, Juan Pablo, is around middle-income countries. Uh, obviously, in terms of climate risks, they're at the center of the discussion. They have their existing development priorities and agendas. They're in a very tight fiscal space. Part of the idea, and this is not uh, – I think it's more in – there are two categories in the Development Committee document. There's like – proposals we're implementing, and another section, which is we're exploring some issues. So under the exploration section, there's some discussion of perhaps better terms and conditions for middle-income countries that would invest in some of these global challenges. And in a way, the bank already does this. For example, in Jordan, Jordan gets um, special terms because they're hosting refugees. They're dealing with the consequences of conflicts nearby. So. Could we imagine something like this for pandemic preparedness? Uh, you know, or maybe Eric is better placed as a shareholder to reflect on that issue. You know, it doesn't have to be grant money. No one thinks necessarily that grant money is the way to go straight to middle incomes. But thoughts? <laughs> why, why not? Why, why not? <laughs> okay. Uh, no, but I'll, I'll, I'll let Eric uh, comment <laughs> more on the, on the financing side. But look, I, I think that Tarman did um, a great introduction, by the way, that we all need to recognize on these five stages that need to be all in place and that are um, interconnected. And they start by the, the very strong country ownership and country leadership. And Amanda, I cannot underscore the importance, not only in low-income countries, but in middle-income countries, of really having ownership on, on this agenda and leading on it and, 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 and making political choices and prioritizing around it. Uh, we still see middle income countries with very low levels mm -hmm. of investment in their health systems, for mm -hmm. example. I won't give names, but, but we know that. Um, we also know that um, in, in, in many of these difficulties, um, health systems are not a priority and, 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 and you, can, you can be even reducing the investment there. Uh, second, uh, the regional mechanisms. I think Africa has taught us a lot and the importance of regional mechanisms that Tarman also brought. And I think middle-income countries in most of the regions of the world have an incredible opportunity of coming together around regional mechanisms to be better prepared for future pandemics. Harmonization, markets, uh, manufacturing, so many other things that can take place on the regional level and strengthen their capacity. Um, of course, 
in the bank, we look at the bank instruments. And um, I do believe that for these global public goods, and by the way, I come from a middle-income country. I, I can relate with them extremely well in my past life. A, a level of concessionality makes a difference mm -hmm. on those global public goods. Mm -hmm. It does make a difference. Mm -hmm. I'll let the problem on every side. But, <laughs> but of course, I, I remember, just to give an example here, uh, the migrant crisis from Venezuela and Colombia, for mm -hmm. example. It, it, it becomes also migration fragility, yeah. a global public good. It, it's not Colombia's problem. I'm sorry. It's a problem that goes everywhere, and it has to be addressed with um, a level, again, of, as Starman said, of country ownership, of regional mechanisms, of concessionality, um, et cetera. And let me finish with one element that hasn't been brought here today so far, but it's extremely important in middle-income countries as well, and it's the role of the private sector. Mm -hmm. I think that's somewhere we, we need to think much more about it. We need to be more disruptive in the thinking of the role of the private sector. Coming here with Prida, by the way, mm -hmm. um, who is the head of the Secretary and the Pandemic Fund, it has a lot to do with uh, this, this journey. Uh, we were talking about how to engage, not only in crisis, but in times of non-crisis, in preparedness and prevention, the private sector. It's also for their interest, and again, in the middle-income country agenda, they're very, very important, as, as you very well know. Mm -hmm. um, let me, let, let me stop there. Um, I, again, I, I think there are a lot of similarities between the middle-income countries and the low-income countries when we come to global public goods, given also very important differences like this last one. Yeah. But, Minister, of course, uh, protecting grant and concessional financing for the lowest-income countries is hugely important. We know the outlook for IDA, which is the World Bank's concessional window, is a bit uncertain. Uh, at the moment, but it, ha could you say something about sort of the importance of IDA and that World Bank uh, financing in general for the whole economy and for, for health in particular? Oh, for the whole economy and health in particular, uh, the IDA grant is very important. Uh, at least it directs you to so many things that you need to do. Mm -hmm. I was just in a meeting where the lower income country and the middle income country met. And uh, we saw that uh, because of the way how things have been funded, a lot of the, the middle income countries dropped back down mm -hmm. to low income country be during the COVID-19. So making sure that they, they get these fundings mm -hmm. and, and use it wisely now before it begins to dwindle down would be very important in making sure that uh, all these countries are stronger and not go backwards instead of going forward. Yeah. I, okay, so let's also ask you, you talked about effectiveness and the best use of funding. Um, so, Eric, I'm going to make you answer three questions at once, <laughs> given time. One uh, is sort of come back on this middle-income country issue how to avoid trade-offs with um, grants and concessionality to the lowest income mm -hmm. countries, number one. Um, second, on response financing, you alluded to sort of the lessons and the experience during COVID-19. The new development committee paper has a section on expanding the crisis response toolkit, which potentially could include, uh, it says it draws on lessons from the World Bank's global COVID-19 response. Does that mean the bank will be ready to finance countermeasures? And like, how specific can we get about that? Because you know, part of the issue is, you know, whether private firms can respond in the event of emergency is whether we know that money is available. So if you could reflect on that um, potentially, and then um, maybe I'll stop there. That's enough, right? Good. All right, only two questions instead yeah. of three. Good. Um, let me just on on the the issue of middle income and. Um, Avoiding trade-offs with low-income countries. I mean, I think this is a this is a really important piece, and um, I want to highlight that the pandemic fund is available to all middle and low-income countries mm -hmm. who are both IDA and IBRD borrowers, and the pandemic fund financing is grants, so I can't get any more concessional. <laughs> it's also it's working <laughs> with the multilateral development banks, United Nations agency partners, and we are looking to expand work with regional bodies around the world. In doing so, we want to use the grant financing that is available from the pandemic fund to twin with other financing, either grant 
or loans from the MDBs. In doing so, we hope to help buy down some of that risk for middle-income countries. Mm -hmm. um, we hope to top up and expand the access to financing available to low-income countries. So that's part of the idea here of this not being a trade-off. Now, when we look at specific projects, those of us who are board members, and I've got a couple of them in the audience here, those of us who are board members have already had a conversation, and we will continue to have conversations about how do we make sure that we are balancing the financing that the pandemic fund provides across a, a different a range of factors. It's regional, it's income, mm -hmm. it's based on need and where highest risk is. There are a lot of those factors and we're gonna have to do that given the heavy demand that Carolyn um, talked about in the, in, the, in the beginning here. Mm -hmm. I think there is a parallel to the work um, that you alluded to, um, um, such as around refugees. I happen to also be the U.S. representative on the Global Concessional Financing Facility, which um, helps countries that are facing um, major refugee crises. But that one is a facility for middle-income countries only. Mm -hmm. And it is a facility for middle-income countries because it is trying to do what we already do in IDA for low-income countries that face um, a large number of refugees. And so therefore, it is trying to buy down the, the financing costs for middle-income countries dealing with these major refugee crises, whether in Jordan or in Colombia, mm -hmm. Costa Rica, or mm -hmm. Lebanon. Um, so, so I think there is a parallel there in mm -hmm. sort of that piece of the model. I think the pandemic fund goes beyond that because we're trying to be a bit more comprehensive mm -hmm. in how, in how we're, we're working and engaging on that. On response financing. Um, there's stuff in the development committee. It's in the piece about work to be done. Yeah. So um, I, don't, I don't have a whole lot to talk yeah. about in terms of specifics here. Um, I prefer the term response financing. Everybody likes to talk about surge financing. Mm -hmm. The problem in my mind is surge financing sounds big and easy, um, and yeah. yet it covers a lot of potentially different things that could be financed in different ways. Um, and where I think we still need to do a lot of the work to, to do, build the consensus behind what is needed and necessary. Um, what is needed in the multilateral development banks like the World Bank or within the IMF, as Tharman also um, referenced. Mm -hmm. um, but it could be also in other fora. Um, and I would also note this is another piece that we'll need to go forward with our global partners um, in civil society, in countries on the ground, but also with the private sector here, mm -hmm. um, because that's a really important piece here. This, this conversation is, um, I would say, just beginning to get up to speed. Um, it's happening within the World Bank and within the international financial institutions, um, within the Development Committee, but it's also happening in the G7 and the G20. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we are grappling with a lot of the questions around what specifically are the missing elements here? Mm -hmm. What specific lessons do we draw from the COVID experience? And, and I would also just highlight here, this isn't just about financing. There are legal issues, there are regulatory yep. issues, there are yep. coordination issues. Yep. There are a host of other things that we also have to focus on. And in some cases, financing might be the, uh, the, the first piece, but in others, it may come later on after we've done some of the additional work to, to sort of identify that. Okay, well, thank, thanks so much. I think that's a, a good cue for all of us to focus on that section of the document, which is called Day one emergency response, a playbook. So stay tuned for more on that. Um, and I'll come back to you, Carolyn, at the end. But let's take three questions from the audience. Please say who you are and where you work. Or go ahead. Hi, thanks so much. Okay, hold on. Just... Thanks so much for the conversation. Colin Puzo Smith with results. Um, I actually want to start, Eric, on some of your comments about the pandemic fund and the idea of making it additive. And side note, really, I'm excited about the idea of the pandemic fund considering buy down. So um, yeah. excited about that. Um, but the idea of making it additive, I want to push back a little bit from a US administration perspective because we saw in the budget request boost to SEPI, boost to the pandemic fund, but then cuts to HTB and malaria. So when we see sort of taking away from primary health care, but investments in pandemic preparedness, it doesn't feel additive, it feels like a trade-off. And so, be curious your reflections on that, but also to think about in the context of the evolution roadmap, the work ahead at the bank, how do we, and I really appreciate in the development committee paper, the real clear commitment 
to not let um, finance for middle-income countries come at the expense of IDA. Really clear, that was a big step forward, I think. How do we sort of prevent those kinds of trade-offs in, in sort of practical terms? What does that look like? Thanks. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Right, oh, hi, Katrina. <laughs> Yes, follow on really on that. Uh, I'm Katrina Haug from Imperial College London. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I just wanted to pick up on um, in the initial uh, point made by the minister on the importance of investing into health system strengthening and community engagement. Uh, and clearly this would be an agenda for us going forward, investing into pandemic preparedness. Mm -hmm. Now we know that, um, and that problem predates the pandemic, it's very difficult to determine the benefits um, of investments into health system delivery platforms because they accrue across so many different disease areas um, um, in, in a primary care system. So I just wanted to hear um, your insights, um, Eric, and potentially also other members of the panel, on what your thoughts are, how to determine investments into surge capacity in the healthcare system, which presumably is investments mainly into medical staff. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, Katarina has an excellent uh, paper on return on investment uh, in pandemic preparedness that I recommend to all of you. Um, Tristan, over here. Hi, uh, Tristan Reed from the World Bank. I want to ask a very narrow question. So during the pandemic, we actually saw that the World Bank surged financing for response inc incredibly rapidly. Um, but there was a choice made by the board specifically to not provide financing for vaccines that had not yet been approved uh, or received regulatory uh, approval. So, so rich countries were able to do that, but financing was not available for low and middle income countries to do that. Um, is that some a policy that will be changed in the future? Good question. Okay, so let me turn back to our panelists. Maybe I'll start with you, Carolyn. Um, especially on this point uh, on the budget requests in the U.S., but I mean, it's not just the United States. I mean, the U.K., for example, they actually cut IDA in half uh, compared to, but they also dropped uh, Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. So it's not just happening. You know, these are these are tough decisions, and it's a, a tight time. But do you have a view on this, Carolyn? A big picture take? Yeah, I mean, and look, kudos to the U.S. Uh, for actually not making these things in competition. I, I hear you on the budget request, Colin, but in terms of, in the, in the last year, mm -hmm. uh, made a new significant commitment to the Global Fund, and then also made a new significant, uh, significant commitment that uh, also crowded in other investments in the pandemic fund. It made very clear that these are two different things and they both need investment. Uh, we need to do a lot more to get the pandemic fund where it needs to go. Um, there's other contributors. I see Australia, <laughs> others in the room. Um, but you know that. So we need a serious resource mobilization effort around that. Look, why the pandemic fund again? Back to Tharman's initial uh, comments and framing. It was set up to actually address the fact that for far too long the world has underinvested in this. Uh, some of those specific public health capacities, right? That every nation needs, but that the world needs um, also to. Um, to help prevent, prepare, and res rapidly respond to pandemics. I also want to link this to the surge financing conversation because, you know, the, again, it's called the, it's called the pandemic fund, and it's got all the PP and the R in its name, but it really is about pandemic preparedness, and we need to solve distinctly for the needs around response. So we do need a bespoke, you know, fit for a purpose uh, response surge financing. Uh, capacity. Otherwise, we're going to see the same thing continue. You're going to see uh, any time an outbreak happens, and they are more frequent, and the next pandemic we know could be on, you know, in the very near horizon, um, then any monies that were set aside, if there are more monies mobilized for pandemic preparedness, will quickly be eclipsed for response. So we have to walk and chew gum at the, the same time. We have to solve for all of these, which is why I go back to actually making sure that these aren't parallel conversations, that as we look to mobilize a, and uh, resource a, a fully and sustainably a pandemic fund, but we also look about that in the context of all these tools and mechanisms and how we're going to leverage uh, the larger amount of financing that hopefully 
will be uh, unleashed by this evolution process. Yeah. Minister, could I ask you to reflect on the question around how do we document the benefits from that investment in these cross-cutting health systems, whether it's for preparedness or whether it's for health itself? And then uh, a second question on response financing. So obviously Liberia lived the horrific uh, experience of sort of waiting around uh, while watching cases increase and not having the budget flexibility to be able to reprogram. Can you just talk about what, what, what would be the better response uh, from the international community in terms of response financing? Um, well, right now, I think the pandemic funds and all the other funding that uh, the countries are receiving uh, can uh, help them to uh, prepare better. Uh, but we have to look at, you know, he talked about uh, the pandemic fund being separate from what countries are receiving. I think right now a lot of programs like the like Glo Global Fund and others are doing vertical uh, uh, programming. So if you're doing vertical program, you are not helping the country overall mm -hmm. to benefit from the funding that you are providing. Mm -hmm. So if all of the funding that are coming to countries are channeled towards uh, preparing the country mm -hmm. in terms of primary health care and all the other things, then the pandemic fund as an added fund will be more beneficial and will begin to reap the benefits of all the funding that are passing through. Okay. Okay, now to you, uh, Eric. Well, do you feel like answering Tristan's direct question about whether uh, the World Bank should finance uh, technologies before they are PQ'd? I'm, I'm not going to get ahead of World Bank board discussions <laughs> okay. and management discussions on, um, uh, on a, you know, uh, people are always told um, in, in any public speaking engagement, don't answer hypotheticals. So, okay. <laughs> so right. I'll avoid it. I'll avoid on that. Um, I did, I did want to make a couple of comments yeah. though, on, on some of the other things. So um, I, think, I think it is important, and, and we in the Pandemic Fund have begun to have this conversation about financial resources. We know that there are constraints on donor governments. We know that there are competing priorities out there, and, and we know that donors and ODA can only provide so much. Um, and so we are, we are looking at and beginning a conversation around innovative financing, alternative financing options and vehicles to generate some of the resources and funding um, for the pandemic fund. Very early in that conversation, it's probably gonna take us quite a bit of time um, because there are a lot of political and economic trade-offs as we go through those things. But I just want to highlight that, that um, you know, in the longer term, we know that this is not something that can be um, sustainably financed for many, many years. That also gets me to a second point, mm -hmm. and it talks about some of the trade-offs and, and the budget things. Um, I, I appreciate Carolyn's comments on, on the U.S. government's um, commitment here. I think you know, we are continuing to try to maintain that focus and that pressure. Um, President Biden um, is asking Congress for an additional $500 million for the pandemic fund in the um, fiscal year 2024 budget. Um, we are urging other donors to step up in the near term as well to continue to boost those resources. But one thing that, that we hadn't really focused on here, I think Juan Pablo referenced it in mm -hmm. sort of the work in the World Bank, it just talks about breaking down silos, having multi-sectoral approaches. We know that that's really important. We have to also do this within the global health community. Mm -hmm. The global health community is deeply siloed amongst institutions that are uh, disease focused and the like. We have to try to bring those together. I am told, I'm, I'm relatively new to this space, but after 35 years of working around development issues, I'm told that this is one of the most uh, sort of fragmented spaces that's out there. Finding long-term solutions means bringing those partners together. We might not break down that complete fragmentation, but we have to get them to work together. In the pandemic fund, for the first time, we have gotten all of these global partners into the room, both as we were designing the fund, as we were designing the call for proposals, and as implementing partners who we are encouraging strongly to work together on the ground in developing proposals. We'll see if that we can we can get there. Um, it's probably not going to be easy given the um, long experience I have in just getting the multilateral development banks to work together. Yeah. Um, but but I think there is a recognition of that need, and and that is one of the key areas we have to focus on. 
Absolutely. Um, so MDB system plus the global health architecture. So there's a lot of challenges ahead. Um, Juan Pablo, the time is up. But any final remarks as uh, you no, head no, into no. the rest I'm, of spring I'm going to look for a paper that yes. I am very interested in. Yes. I want to congratulate you and the CGD, Amanda, for maintaining this dialogue and pushing forward. As Carolyn said, we all need to do more together. There's an unfinished agenda. I'm sorry to say so. And that agenda only increased because of the last three years. So we need to integrate our efforts and we need to insist and insist and insist because it's going to be a long journey. Excellent. Well, thank you so much to the panelists and to you, an in-person audience, for joining us and those online. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, to be continued. Okay. Thank you.